Good afternoon, a warm welcome to Conversations. My name is Emily Butler, I'm the Conversations Curator here at Art Basel. We're really honored to be hosting this panel this afternoon with a major collector and member of our Global Patrons Council, Komal Shah, who has paid attention to the representation of women in her philanthropic and collecting activities. She's joined by the artists Katarina Grossa and Ferele Bays to discuss the challenges they have had to overcome uh, and to present female perspectives in their practices. The panel will be moderated by Mark Godfrey, who's a curator and the co-editor of the publication Making Their Mark, Art by Women in the Shah Karg Collection, which is launching here during Art Basel. And there's a couple of copies around in the room. You're very welcome to and take them and to, and to enjoy them. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end of the panel, and I'll try and relay any of those that are posted online. Um, I will hand over now to Mark to, to uh, moderate the panel. But before I do that, please do give our speakers, Pirele, Katarina, Komal, and Mark, a very warm round of applause and enjoy the conversation. Um, thank you so much, uh, Emily, and it's great to be joined by all three of you. I just first of all want to say hi and give a shout out to Katie Siegel, who's in the audience, who's the co-editor of the book that you see on the screen there, wherever she is. Thank you, Katie. Um, and uh, Katerina and Firale, I'm going to begin by asking you some questions. Um, you have very different practices, but one thing that connects you both is um, what you've done to expand painting beyond canvases, beyond small objects seen in galleries, but into environments. And, uh, but at the same time, you maintain the practice of, of making paintings. So I want to ask you about that expansion. Uh, and starting with you, uh, Katerina, um, what, what were the, the first reasons that made you want to um, take spray painting and basically create, uh, we'll take painting outside of the canvas, outside of the gallery, and to make these amazing environments that we've seen uh, over the years? Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us. And it's a great honor to sit here with Firole and I've never met you in person, but followed your work. So, and also the book, I think, is really amazing. It gave me so much insight into practices that I wasn't familiar with. And it's right, Mark, I have always actually, also even as a little child, I have had this kind of movement in my instincts, in my system. And I did paint large paintings even as a little one. And I painted on the wall or on the garage of my father's. And it didn't feel like I would leave the canvas for me. I did not have this uh, feeling of, oh my God, I'm doing something forbidden. It was just the other way around. I took the space for granted. I thought it was mine, and I thought it has to be part of the painting practice. Painting is something so easy to place somewhere. It is so mobile. It doesn't need um, electricity. It is just the bucket and the brush and you. It can be on a surface of a rock. It can be in the cave, as we all know. And that is a practice that I really feel connected to. And later on, as I was, of course, more conscious of my history and uh, my uh, uh, painterly environment, I used it, of course, to get visibility, to make painting part of our social everyday, of our mundane. I, I was wondering, how could a painting be amongst all the other um, homogeneous surfaces of the handheld, of the um, phone. How can painting be part of that production of images? And how can it offer something that we don't have on the surface of the screen? So the idea was, of course, to be more body related, more tactile, and to stimulate, like you can see here, walk through something that um, stimulates your whole cell system and not only your maybe cognitive um, part of reading a small scale information, which is fantastic and very useful, but my understanding was to go somewhere else and envelop your system with um, information that is visual. And you always wanted to define these as, as paintings rather than you know, sculptures or installations. Or, or were those definitions important to you or not? Yeah, my work doesn't like to be defined. Uh, it is um, somehow 
a technique that is um, making it difficult to talk about it, but on the other hand, it gives me far more reach to develop my thinking. The work is very hybrid, and I'm very interested in the fact that a painting and the thought of painting can be inserted with knowledge of other fields without compromising the painted field, in a sense. So it looks like this is, for example, only possible because of the architectural um, body that holds it up. In that case, it was the carriage works in Sydney, a big theater complex, and that is true. So there is an ecology between the host and the work itself. But um, what I do with the work comes very, very deeply from painterly practice. Yeah, thank you. Um, Firule, we have the opportunity here in uh, the Unlimited section to see one of the um, one of the works you've made that comes out of a long research about the Palace of Saint Souci, uh, and you know one could call these works installations or sculptures, but the practice of painting is very important to how you approach these um, and how you've approached other environments that you've made uh, and uh, the colours that you use and, and, and the way blue functions is important. So I was wondering if you can also talk about how you connect. Um, painting to the to the installations or the environments like like the one we have in Unlimited and what you're seeing over here. Um, definitely, I I want to reiterate what Katerina said of oh I'm a bit echoing of being honored to be here and really grateful to be even with you. I the fact that you know my name is amazing. To be in your company is an honor. Thank you, Komal, for bringing us together. Thanks. And Mark as well. Also, a big shout out to the installation team who helped make that beautiful sculpture with me to finalize it. They're in the front row, and I wanted to just give you a quick <laughs> thank you, class. Um, just, it's um, incredible how um, something that you think of in the studio can manifest and can extend your hand by joining with someone else's artistry. This sculpture, which I think of more as a permeable painting, because after all, it is an extension of trompe l'oeil, the trompe l'oeil gesture. It's plaster, concrete, and wood that looks like a building structure that's <laughs> emerged from the sea. Um, this illusory effect that is always so present in painting can sometimes feel alienating. It can make you, like Katarina was saying, um, engage solely conceptually. But in it being permeable, in it being something you can touch and move around and feel uh, part of, is for me a way of engaging the senses so that a history that might be unknown can become more accessible and perhaps spark your curiosity. This Sans Souci was made 50 years, my Sans Souci in northern Haiti, was made 50 years apart from the Sans Souci in eastern Germany and Berlin. And uh, to think of the forces that be that created both, why were there certain aesthetic choices? They were both in this regal yellow with a copper ceiling. Um, and what histories have made them be as they are in the present? This was an iteration that uh, was created in Boston. And whenever I create a piece or, or install it, I merge both the geography of where it's currently installed, so the geo coordinates, and where the original one is. I think of these almost as being an extension of the practices of someone like Gordon Maddox Clark. He would take a whole splice of a building and that splice would reveal so much of the nuance and the lived history of that space, not just of the people who live there, but the communities around them, what helped them, what broke it, what made it. Um, and I can't do that with a palace. <laughs> so the best thing I can do for the audience is to give you the feeling of that, to bring the nuance and the history and um, the love that's in it. Thank you. Um, Kamal, you've um, collected the works of both the artists over here, and uh, you live in a beautiful uh, house surrounded by works uh, of theirs. 
Um, I'm just showing a couple of images of, of where you live. Uh, and um, I was just wondering, when, when, you, when you see these other practices or these other parts to their practice, huge environments, um, installations, which come out of smaller works as well. Um, how do you, what do you think is the role of responsibility of the collector to support practices beyond, beyond, the, thing, beyond the act of, of acquiring a work for the house? What, what kind of things have you been involved in that go to supporting the wider practices? So I'm going to answer your question in different ways. Um, first of all, I, to me, scale, power, muscularity in works by these artists is a huge turn on. And, and to, for them to be so ambitious is really inspiring to me as a collector. Um, you know, when I met Firale for the first time at her studio, she was painting the work she eventually made at the MoMA window, 21 feet wide. It was a wall of a palace, perhaps the San Suji, where she was reinstating the queen and the princess. Please correct me when I'm wrong. Um, 21 feet wide, 10 feet tall. And, and the moment I saw that work, I had this real gut reaction where I, where I, not only was I impressed, but I absolutely wanted to have it. Of course, it was going to the MoMA window, and I spoke to Mark actually then, right after seeing that work, and said, oh my god, I'm going to give it my best. Um, I think the other angle to this whole conversation is women have been subdued for so long that when there's scale and ambition and muscularity, it speaks to me in a way where, in my bid to ensure parity for both women and male artists, that, that you know, women have conquered scale, women have conquered power. Uh, uh, to add to that, um, again, like everything in here is constructed, it looks like plaster, but these are portraits of the two daughters in exile. Daughters. Yeah. Thank and there you. are, um, if any of you are aware, there are these beautiful portraits of King Henry Christophe and his son uh, that were painted by the same painter that painted Napoleon. But there are no formal portraits of the queen and her two daughters. And so to evoke them, to make them present, um, is always an impulse in these portraits, to give them full presence. So I think also as a collector, going to the heart of your question, um, it is truly our job to support these massive installations because of how experiential they are. I remember seeing your MoMA PS1 installation and it took away my breath. And as a collector, I feel that whenever there are these installations happening, I do my best to support them. Thank you. I mean, and the next shared uh, topic I want to come to Shouldn't be surprising if you look at the stage. Um, here's me, black trousers, gray, white shirt, and here's all of you. And you, you all have very different approaches to color. Um, and I want to sort of mine that a little bit. Uh, and Kamal, you, you said that you were drawn to kind of grand ambitions uh, and the muscularity and the sort of the, the power of these, these artists' work. But you're also drawn to colour, and colour is very important to you, and that comes from, I believe, your family growing up. So I was wondering if you can say a little bit about that, and then I'm going to ask both of you about colour as well. So my journey is that I grew up in a town called Ahmedabad in India. My father was a textile trader, and we grew up very middle class and didn't really have a lot of toys and... Um, goodies to sort of to pass time with. Uh, but my father would bring these swatches of textiles of different colors and such to the house. And we would create these little dolls made with marbles um, and a white cloth covering it. And then we'd experiment with different outfits. Um, and so that was sort of my first experience at color combination and color theory. Um, and I ended up teaching programming and studying computer science and sort of moving on to a different world. But I think that that sense of color palette um, stayed in my mind. And, and you know, India is vibrant in, in, its, in its approach, um, very strong in its color sense. Um, and so I grew up surrounded by color around me. And 
and that richness. And, and I think subliminally it sort of transferred into what I look at paintings as well. Um, when I came to the United States, um, I started going to museums, had never been to museums in India. And some of the artists I first fell in love were abstract expressionists. And Kandinsky, Rothko were sort of some of my first loves, if you will. And, and I think that that's also another point in time where I soaked in color a lot more. Um, Katerina, we're looking at one of your paintings from 2015, and it's characteristic in terms of a you know, massive proliferation of color. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you approach color and, and the, the new colors that have become available to you maybe over the course of, of making your work? Yeah, well, um, so it took me a little while to understand that color was my core medium. So I went through a lot of different approaches. I studied art in different art schools and there was a moment when nothing worked for me and I sat down and looked what was my thread that would go through all the different experiments and it was color. So I restarted my whole practice, focusing on very simple color schemes. And I'm, I've started, restarted my whole thinking how color leads me towards an image. And it really is that the transformative power of color has become my guiding tool. Because one thing is that I have color, the other one is how do I actually transform it into an image field? How do I get it into a system that has a certain consistency and an internal logic? And I started to use the spray gun. And with that spray, I do not touch the surfaces anymore, but by, I go, I rather hover above them. So I could all go with magenta from your toes, toes over this little um, stage down to the floor and over you and then I would connect us all with that one swath of magenta color. So the color is able to land anywhere. It can be hosted by any kind of surface and structure. And by that gesture, I not only transgress different areas and bind them together, but I also infuse them with um, a certain an anarchy towards meaning, towards territory, towards um, possession towards uh, difference and that power of transforming something with color and yet at the same time proposing something at the same time I found so fascinating so the way that color gets close to your system the vibration of colors reaches you far earlier in my case reached me far earlier than a text or um, a set of rules or a concept that's set in stone. So it's almost like the sound of the voice before you hear the text of a song, right. that color takes you in before you know it. You're already starting to deal with an optical or a visual or uh, a somewhat um, aggressive movement. And then that's aggression that is not coming from storytelling, but from being close to you, of coming something towards you. And that's how color started to be for me far more than only um, coming from the tradition of light and Matisse and, you know, separating color and drawing, like we can see in the modernist um, experiment. But color has also become for me like an entity that is in itself so complete. So the red that we see on your wonderful dress is already in itself complete. It doesn't need another explanation, another tool, another substory. And the completeness of yellow, blue, red, green, you take it, in itself gives it a, such an enormous sense of autonomy and freedom that it can be thrown at incomplete structures. And that's what I basically do when I leave the studio and work in circumstances that look somewhat difficult and um, yeah, neglected. I mean, if I understand you correctly, color can be transgressive and it can go over things, it can exceed borders. But as far as I understand in your practice, co colors don't have symbolic meaning or anything yeah. like that. Coming to, to you, Firili, we we've talked in the past about um, the, um, the long sort of history of uh, West African religions and 
some of the colours that are associated with some West African gods and how those colours pick up meanings over the Middle Passage and in different cultures in the Caribbean and, and in America. And sometimes I believe that when you use blues and reds, um, you are thinking about those, those kinds of significance about colour. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about the, those uh, like ramifications of colour in your work? Yeah, so I guess the instinct is very much like Katarina is trying, or her efforts of making it fully experiential. But I am acknowledging how there is a tradition of having a intense chromophobia because it is boundless. Color seeps into your eyes, it permeates through your body, it can change your body chemistry just from it going through your retina. There is a certain uh, aggressive resistance like, to it, especially in the global north. And so um, I wanted to unpack that and to bring in places where um, we can examine other ways of seeing color and how we theorize that color without many times acknowledging it. So Joseph Albers, that the, you know, beautiful theory we've all been taught, or many of us have been, um, whether aware or not, taught as acceptable color or acceptable ways of consuming color, um, was influenced by other really complex structures. One of them being the pantheon of color and the symbolic colors associated to that pantheon of West African diasporic religions. I myself was born in the Caribbean and um, there are many iterations of Yoruba, for instance, influenced within different islands, all the way down to Brazil, for instance. And whenever, for instance, we have, we see a Leonardo and we see this beautiful ultramarine blue, that blue usually infers a Gallic blue, the influence of Northern Europe onto the Renaissance. But when I bring it, I also want to add the fact that very parallel to that is a entity or a force that it would be someone like Yemanja, the water uh, goddess, the, the, the space of healing and regeneration that emerges out of the ocean. These are threads that are perhaps unnamed, but I want us to all to be able to acknowledge them as we traverse these different spaces, that they are fully experiential, but they have been categorized in very minute ways by all our culture. So yeah, just awareness. Thank you. Um, I now want to ask a couple of questions about art histories. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the, I guess, ambitions of the book uh, that has just been published on, on the collection, Kamal, is to open up new ways of understanding art history by gathering together the work of 136 different artists. Um, new stories are, are open, new connections between the artists become possible to think about because of what's happened in this book. Can you say something about your ambitions to turn the collection from being more than just something that you live around uh, or uh, into something that's more about an archive, a, a publication, a, perhaps an exhibition that allows for these connections to be made? Okay, so looking back, um, you know, I studied as an engineer and worked with men all my life or until 10, 12 years ago. And um, my bosses had been men. I assumed I was equal to all men, etc., cetera, um, and never really thought about gender as an issue um, of differentiation. Um, I, I have two children, uh, 21 and 19 years old. And when our 21-year-old was six years, um, he needed occupational therapy. And that's when the genetic programming kicked in, and the mother as in me, I used to run three organizations in Yahoo, I decided that if I didn't take time off, that I would always feel guilty, right? 
And so that was sort of that one moment. But then as my daughter started growing up, she would come home saying she wasn't good at math, and, which she was, but she wanted to fit into her, her, her peers um, growing up in California, and she felt embarrassed to be good at math. <laughs> and, and so then I'm suddenly realizing what shifts that are in, in our minds, psychologically, societally, um, in how we look at men versus women. Um, and some of the first works that I fell in love with, um, Jacqueline Humphreys, Laura Owens, were all artists that were women, but I fell in love with the work. And I started getting to know these artists better. Um, and, you know, met Mary Heilman, Charlene Von Heil, Dana Schutz, etc. But that's when I really started understanding how the, in the art world, the odds were so stacked against women. And, and now there are lots of numbers that are being sort of mined almost every day. Yesterday there was a fabulous talk um, led by Charlotte Burns. But some of the, the staggering numbers are women artists make 10 cents on the dollar, right? And I, I went to business school. We worry at, as an alum, and I'm on the board, but we worry about how women business school alums make 60 to 80 cents on the dollar. And in the art world, it's 10 cents, right? And then, you know, Artnet and Charlotte Burns published um, an article which, to me, took my sort of breath away, which said 12% of works acquired between 2008 and 2018 by museums in the US were by women artists, right? 12%. And this is talking about 51% of the population. Um, and, and so over the last 10 years, it sort of really became clear to me that there had to be a mission to, to balance, to bring balance into the world. And the way I approached it was to really talk about how amazing these artists were, which is exactly how I feel. But because of societal bias, because of, what, of our stereotyping, we sometimes are not listening, we're not paying attention to them. And so Mark, actually, uh, who's been a companion and a mentor, suggested creating a book in January 21. And, and, some, and in my mind, I had initially thought of book, a book project as a vanity project. Here, come look at my collection, look at my shiny things. But once Mark and I started talking, I realized that this was really about inscribing the work and the artists into the canon of art history. Creating these dialogues, really talking about influences, and bring, shining a light on this work was super instrumental. And I'm so glad that Katie Siegel, who's right there, um, joined us in this book project. Um, two and a half years later, we have this book, and it has generated an incredible response. And almost every day, I've been getting text, Instagram feedback on how they're really learning things from the book and how they didn't know many of the artists existed. Um, that has inspired us to take this a step further and think about how do we bring the work in front of people. Right? Um, we live in California, not everyone's going to be coming there. Um, and so we are going to kick off a series of shows um, within the US, at least for now, um, starting with New York and then going to Berkeley, um, University of Berkeley, and then um, WashU in St. Louis as well. So the journey continues in terms of expanding the vision. We have a speaker series at Stanford that's called Artists on the Future, um, which has become one of the most one of the most um, important and also widespread conversation series uh, with about 7,000 views per conversation. We've had eight artists so far, all women. We never say that they are women, right? I mean, there are so many amazing collectors who've built great collections with all male artists, but they're never called male collections. Um, and so I've chosen to not add gender as sort of at the forefront of these um, descriptions. And, um, and it's done really well. So. I think we'll continue to experiment and, um, in terms of how do we bring attention. I don't know how much you two, uh, the artists, like, pay attention to the fate of your work once it leaves the studio or the gallery, but when, when you see that the work has entered a collection like Komal's, um, what do you find interesting and productive about that? And what, have you been able to look at the book and are there any um, any connections that you think are interesting by virtue of the fact that your work is, is in this collection? 
If you wouldn't mind, I, one of the things that I love about Como's collection is that it's, you know, there's many that will go straight into storage and your work will potentially be loaned to a museum and then it will have a public life. But I love that she actually loves the work enough to live with it and it has an experiential life beyond institutions. Um, there are things that I do in painting that are only for human eyes. It's very difficult to document by a camera, through video, or anything like that. You have to move around it to really experience it. And the fact that you get to do that, your kids do that, and then you lend it to, you know, I think I've asked you for maybe like six different institutions and you've always been willing to loan them. And I'm really grateful for that. But that they have a life. They're not hiding somewhere in the dark waiting to be activated. They're activated daily. And I appreciate that. And ha um, Catherine, have you spent any time with the book or been able to think about the, the connections that your work has with any of the other artists in the collection? Yeah, I spent a lot of time with um, the PDF of the book. <laughs> and I think it was really inspiring. And I would recommend really to have that book because I think, and that's very special about your collection, that it starts um, somehow, it started from your personal perspective in a sense and your intu intuitive relationship to the works. But what it has done with this book and the research of um, Katie can't be um, talked about enough because it's so rich and had so many new aspects to it that it starts to retell the story. And I think that is really, really special because I think um, private collections are always a miracle somehow and it's beautiful to be in all these collections. So I'm happy if a really great collection is decided to um, take one or two or maybe more works of mine into consideration. But I think this is very special in the sense that you get a new perspective on what abstraction could be because the maybe sometimes ideological or conceptual or even strategic framework of conception is so socially male um, constructed that we get a completely different understanding of what that can be. And that abstraction has to do with ungroundedness, with unruliness, with not being part of it, with coming from the outside, with having expertises and perspectives that are not um, minimalized, but in the contrary, that are maximalized, and yet it is an abstract language, you know? And that is so fantastic about this book. And it right away made me call friends and say, we have to do this as well, because it is very much centered on American um, yeah. knowledge, which is so organic and understandable. But I think we should all make an alliance about it, because I think what is ultimately also maybe the issue with a book or a collection that is focused on that kind of um, a subject matter is that it puts women exactly into that place of being there on their own. And that's where we have to get away from. You know, I think that is maybe the next step and that it can only be done with your help, that we forge alliances that take us and uh, take away from us this disadvantage of constantly saying how we are disadvantaged. And that is really not changing it. Because we know what you were just saying. We know the situation. It's been analyzed throughout the whole of society. It's not only in the art world, it's in the system. And we have to completely get away from that terrible um, thing that we have to say that we earn only a third or a half or, you know, we're getting like 60% or 50% or sometimes only 30% of what a male colleague gets. And that has to stop. That should be said by the other people that are part of the society. Absolutely. And that is equally applicable to all sorts of unbalanced systems. So we have to really to change something. And that's why we're here today, I believe at least. Yeah? We gotta make like a game, play a game and make a promise that each of you and us just I one this. thing, <laughs> one thing a month, only one thing that is good for women. Very decidedly, where in, like you did with the book, like Katie did, like Mark did with this amazing essay. So, and then draw another three people in each month. That would make for all of you already exponential difference in our mindset, in our, uh, so 
that was a long answer, but that's what I was thinking I would like to say. <laughs> so I also want to give a shout out to... Thank you. That was, oh, that was wonderful and very spontaneous, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Chris Bedford, the director of SF MoMA, who's in the room, who has really been so focused on, uh, on setting parity hmm. based on gender and race. And he still remains a mentor on shaping the collection. Um, but there are, I hope that there are more museum directors that will start thinking about shaping their trajectories, much like Chris is doing now. Can I ask a question about geographies? I mean, Catherine, you, you just mentioned that when you looked at the book, you, you see a big focus on American knowledge. Um, actually, the German um, contingent within the book is quite strong. Uh, Jutta Kurter, Monica Baer, Charlene von Heil, um, and a couple of others, less, I guess, into the 60s. We, we don't, there's not yet Charlotte Posnesca or some others, but I think certainly there's, um, recently there's a big commitment to expand the geographical range of work in, in the collection. And of course, your work fairly comes out of thinking about many different geographies connecting um, the Dominican Republic and Haiti and New York and many places in, in the African diaspora. And can you just say something, Kamal, about how you see your, the, the, the range of geographies expanding um, in, in the collection? Absolutely. I mean, maybe even, is there anything new to the collection from the last couple of days that you would be prepared <laughs> to disclose <laughs> in that relationship? Um, unfortunately, there is new stuff. Um, uh, from the last two days. Um, Bertina Lopez, who grew up in Mozambique and was an activist painter in the 60s and 70s and then moved to Rome and spent 50 years of her life in Rome and moved into abstraction, is one of these interest, super interesting stories to me um, where she again wasn't recognized while she was alive, but now various institutions, including MoMA New York, are starting to look at the work and collect it. Um, one of the works in the collection, and this was actually Katie um, really illuminating uh, the work to me, was artist by the name of Faith Ringold. And we have some of her um, tapestries, um, abstract paintings on tapestries. Guess what the tapestries are? They are Tibetan tankas. And Faith Ringold traveled extensively in Asia and India. And, and to me, some of these artists, while they are US-based artists, have really been world-class travelers, right? You've got Havardina Pindel, who actually makes paintings on different countries she visits. And so I think that exchange has been happening even while they are US-based artists. Um, so I, I'm always looking at stories. Tomi Otaki is another artist um, who was born in Japan and then to escape arranged marriage, moved to Brazil, and stayed there until she passed away at the age of 104. And uh, incredible abstract paintings. Um, those stories intrigue me very much. Um, abstraction to me has also been a tool in terms of bringing together geographies. Um, where sort of the evolution of the collection uh, goes in terms of expansion, um, I think is unclear in a way. Um, I'm still listening to what in what sort of catches the eye and the heart and the mind. Uh, but hopefully, eventually, there will be a strategy to all of this. Um, just in terms of expanded geographies, Firili, maybe you could just say a few words about this work, which is another work that people can see on the fair, because it actually uh, has as its ground a world map. Yeah, so I actually uh, very deliberately paired this that is on the booth with the work that's in Unlimited, um, there are similar histories. Um, I made the, the first idea for this painting came when I was traveling in Puglia and I woke up with joyful tears from a dream where this feathered creature came in the middle of the ocean and said, I will never abandon you at sea again. And I just thought of how many of my ancestors had traveled this space willingly and unwillingly, and what loving and care was required for them to be here, for me to be here, for them to survive, and how much of that we can continue expressing towards each other. Um, and it's over two figures overlaid onto a map from the 
mid uh, 19th century of world migration patterns, according to the French. Um, and one very big omission that is in it is that my island just disappears entirely from it. This avant-garde of infographics just erases the island of Hispaniola and what used to be perhaps around 60% of the French economy. Um, so just understanding how factual data, as it's inscribed in a lot of these documents, are more projections of desire and how our lived selves, our um, presence is testament to other spaces of being um, and how to honor that. Another, I guess, fun thing from this is in a different layered um, way of acknowledging the mission and presence is that the figures are an ode to Manta Tupinambas. They're these feathered capes that are, were originally from Brazil and that are now in very few collections around Europe, the Vatican being one of them, Denmark being one, another. Um, and De uh, Max Ernst has this gorgeous painting called The Alchemical Wedding, and it's this red feathered caped figure um, with a lot of symbolic structures. But if you look at a historic documentation of these feathered capes that were meant to be worn by a priest to have access to these other spaces that were only accessible to the only beings that have access to the sky, birds, um, these feathers that don't exist, animals that don't exist in the world any longer. Um, I wanted to be, bring back the meaning of that cape and give these two figures a way of um, accessing, again, that alchemical wedding, that the love and care that was required for us to be here and to survive. Mark, Thank you very much. I think we have about 10 minutes. Should we open up? I was about to do that. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has a question, there's a question over there in the second row. Uh, are we um, asking for microphones? And there's one in the back there. Or do people just shout out? OK, microphone. so please wait for the microphone. Uh, so far, I can see two questions, but just put your hand up if you've got one. So. You first, and then in the back, second. Hi. Um, it's really fascinating, Kamal, to um, encounter you quite recently, actually, through the New York Times, or where I re a recent uh, article that I read. And um, I, I'm an Indian gallerist, and talking, uh, it's, it's fascinating, because India, Indian collectors are so regional. So for me to actually encounter somebody who's been so deeply invested invested in the West is is different. You know, it's something that uh, even Indian collectors in, in the West are always looking at Indian art. So uh, my question to you is, is there a kind of other way around of looking at Indian art? And uh, because, you know, the global stage for Indian art is now is huge, and I'm just very, very interested because I feel like your your accent is still Indian. So, uh, <laughs> so if you were to ask me my nationality, I'd say I'm Indian, uh, for sure. And um, and I, I will say that you know I arrived as a student in the U.S. Um, about 32 years ago, and uh, so I've lived more than 60 percent of my life in the U.S. Um, when I arrived. Um, I was very homesick, but three months later, I called up my parents and said, this is home. I'm not coming back. However, um, that is not to say that I will, never, I will not be an Indian. Um, in terms of the art collection, I think that having become a more global citizen, this is what I connected with on a visual level. I became a trustee at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, um, but I realized that the way I had expanded and my eyesight had expanded, that it was much more global. Um, and this is not to discount in any way that there are not amazing artists in India or in South America or Asia in general. And certainly we do have a few Indian women artists in the collection. Um, but I do think that in some ways, like many of us, I'm questioning sort of the US dominance and that it's time to now really start sinking into um, what exists outside of the U.S. as well. So I'd be very open to any suggestions you have. So the next question is further towards the back. Thanks. <coughs> uh, 
Hello. Uh, thank you so much for such an inspiring conversation. It was very insightful. My name is Natsuka. I'm the first, uh, I'm the founder of the first international gallery in Mongolia. And we are pioneering everything in, the, in our country regarding arts and culture, working with artists, curating exhibitions and everything. Um, I found your conversation very inspiring to me. And I wanted to ask you, Kamal, when you first started your um, collection, did the art kind of speak to you or did you have some sort of a connection or a dialogue with it? I found it very interesting. Thank you. Sorry, what is the question? So um, when you first started having your collection and selection of works going into exhibitions or museums or galleries, did you feel the artwork kind of had some sort of a connection to you when you select the work or was a dialogue between you and the work itself? So there are many answers to that, but absolutely, I have to have that gut visceral reaction to the work. Um, but, but I would say that the moment I started thinking about art and sort of retired from my tech life, um, I started taking a lot of photos. And several friends and mentors of mine decided that I really needed to join them in more sort of art immersion trips. Um, one such trip in 2014, and I had been collecting a little bit before then, but in 2014, um, a friend by the name of Pamela Joyner decided that I needed to go to New York to look at some art, and it, the leader of our trip was Mark Godfrey from, at the time, the Tate. And I visited the Whitney Biennial in 2014, and I was mesmerized by these two works, one by Jacqueline Humphreys and one by Laura Owens. And I had no idea who they were, let alone gender. And in fact, I remember being so, kind of having this moment where my heart beat a lot faster and I said, oh my God, I must acquire this work. Um, and then of course, um, I think at this moment, now that sort of I've matured a little bit as a collector, there are a lot more questions one asks, but the falling in love has to happen first. <laughs> Are there other questions? If there is... Any other questions? So I do want to apologize for the number of cookies. I only brought 70 cookies um, that were shipped from New York to San Francisco to Basel. Um, and they have the cover of the book, but I didn't realize that so many of you were going to come. So for that, I'm super grateful and also apologetic that we don't have enough cookies for you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.